Eggs are hot. Hey everybody, it is Thursday night. That means it's time for AMA Ask Me Anything. My name is Pete Baker with Alta Vista Assembly in beautiful bucolic East Bakersfield, California. And we're with you for the next few minutes to take questions that some of you have submitted and sent in. So we're pleased to do that. I am joined tonight as always by Matthew who is a fount, a wizard of technical knowledge, and he will be moderating and he will be uh, producing at the same time. Quite a hat trick you're gonna pull off here. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, Matthew, uh, greet the people and tell them how we play the game. Mm, hello everybody, my name is Matthew, as uh, previously Boy, geez, stated. that was so <laughs> cheesy. Um, uh, uh, thank you for- <laughs> Look at the people. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, if you, I'm trying to do stuff. Be, I know you know, you're multitasking, and, but... You, you, anyway, if you have questions, you can uh, ask them in the comments. We will read those questions um, first. Uh, if you want to remain anonymous, just submit the question uh, to us, DM us, direct message us, and I get those as well. Um, so we will we'll read those and get that going for you, uh, which, whichever come in, okay? And we have some that were submitted um, previously. To today. You know, we've gotten complaints about the clock being wrong. Did you put batteries in it? No, I didn't put a battery in it, but I'm going to set it. Uh, Jason, send us batteries if you're watching. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to put Pastor Pete's address right here the whole time, so anybody can send Let's us do batteries. Let's do a telethon and get some get some battery That's funds true. for batteries. We should. Anyway, <laughs> funds for batteries. you know, even a stop clock is twi right twice a day. You know that. That's You've a, heard that, right? Yeah. Okay, well, it's right right now. Oh, man. Okay, fire when ready. <laughs> I don't know how we recover from that one. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask this one first. It was submitted us, to us earlier on, I think, Instagram or something. It couldn't have been submitted later. Then we wouldn't have it. Oh, okay. We're doing that today, huh? <laughs> well, Jesus, uh, well, Jesus taught that paro... Parousia? Parousia would happen in his disciples' lifetime. Paul taught this, as well as John of Patmos. It's been 2,000 years. Uh, where is he? <laughs> Good question. Uh, where is he? Um, you know, where is that's Jesus? A, yeah, where is Jesus? Uh, that's a question that's asked a lot. You know, we've been hearing about this second coming thing for a long time, parousia. Good catch, by the way, on the part of the questioner. Um, it is a valid question, and I say good catch with the use of the word parousia, Greek word which simply means the coming, typically the coming of an important official, king, somebody like that, an announced coming uh, that sometimes could be a surprise inspection. Um, so that's the idea. And that is the actual biblical New Testament term for it, Greek term. You know that the Bible, New Testament was written in Greek originally, not English. Um, and that is the technical term. That is the actual term that's used when, it's, when the coming of Christ, the return of Christ is talking about is, is talked about as a parousia, uh, this special coming of a, of a valued person. So a good catch on that person's part, whoever asked the question. Uh, rather than using the more popular word that in many Christian circles is used, rapture, uh, which is not a biblical word at all, it's not a Greek word, it's a, a Latin word, rapturo, which means the catching away, and it was a word that was applied much, much later, not until probably the mid-1800s that people began to think about the return of Christ, then they assigned this Latin word rapturo to that event. Again, it's not a word that even appears in the New Testament. So parousia is a much better descriptive word uh, than rapturo. Um, in, in addressing the whole thing, I would, um, I would emphasize my own personal opposition to a lot of pop Christianity that, um, that does talk about the second coming and does seem to have a timeline and could tell you, you know, he's going to come and then this is going to happen and this is going to happen. And they've got it, the scheme all figured out. In, in the old days, uh, I can remember prophecy preachers that would bring their big charts that would be, you know, 15 feet long and it would have all of the scheme of the end time figured out entirely and on the chart. Um, there is that kind of idea in pop Christianity, and I, and I kind of take emphasis against that. I kind of oppose some of those ideas. I don't know how you figure all that out, actually. I, certainly my brain's not subtle enough. 
I do know that the first century believers, as the questioner has said, did many in many cases expect Jesus to return in their lifetime. Uh, the way they understood it, the way they processed it, the way they were hoping. They thought Jesus would return before they exited the planet. Uh, clearly he has not, and so that's why the question is a valid one. Uh, but first century believers, they did sense that he, it was an imminent return. It would be within their lifetimes. Um, and part of the reason that they, that they tilted in that direction was because they were facing intense persecution. It would be nice if Jesus came back now because the Romans are breathing down our neck and we're getting thrown into arenas and we're being imprisoned. And you read about some of that persecution in the book of Acts, but it intensified after that. Uh, and throughout the first century and into the second and into the third, uh, it could be dangerous at certain times, not all the time, but it could be very deadly and dangerous to be a, a Jesus follower. So, you know, Jesus, if you're thinking of coming back, today would be a good day. Uh, so they lived with that constant presence and hope that he would and and even con conviction that he would return in their lifetime because it would be a good idea. Um, we do not live with, with that kind of persecution, so we do not have the urgency or the wish that he would return uh, like our first century believers did. Um, the whole Bible ends, the book of Revelation ends, even so, come Lord Jesus, because uh, if the book of Revelation means anything, it means that it's, it was a rough time to be a Christian, however you interpret the, belief, the, the Revelation. So even so, come Lord Jesus is how the whole book ends, because they did live with that. We don't live with that. Now, there are believers in places that do. I'm through Zoom. I'm, I'm in contact on a weekly basis with groups of Christians in other parts of the world, sensitive areas where... Um, if it were found out that they were Zooming, some of the things were Zooming, they might be in some degree of trouble. And they do live with a fairly high level of persecution and it can get out of hand pretty quickly. Those people, I will tell you, are expecting Jesus to return in a way that we, we don't think about it. So what I'm saying is that the circumstances partly generated this thought that he will come in my lifetime. But again, the questioner is correct. That's what some of those first century people lived with. Um, however, it was generated, uh, and people today the same. Uh, but urgent or not, whether we have an urgency about the coming of Christ and a desire to see him return or not, the best piece of information we've got about Jesus' second coming comes in Matthew 24 from the lips of Jesus when he says, nobody knows the day or the hour. In other words, nobody living knows the time. In fact, Jesus said at that time, nobody knew but the Father. Even he was not privy to it. Now we could assume that now that he is, but even he at that time, but no human for sure. And no human today has an insight. That's why the prophecy teachers and the date setters and all of the rest, they're full of baloney. Because uh, I'll take Jesus at his word. He says, nobody knows the day or the hour. Nobody knows. The best piece of information we've got about the recoming of Jesus is we don't know when it's going to be. In fact, he says, I will come when you least think I will come, <laughs> whatever that means. Um, so that's the best piece of information we've got uh, that we do not know. 1 Thessalonians 4 indicates it was a letter Paul wrote to a, a group of a messianic community made up of Jews and non-Jews that were Jesus followers. And he writes to the Thessalonian group. Um, he says, you know, I, I understand you're under some distress. And their distress was that they believed Jesus was going to return, but some of their number had died, physically died. And so their dilemma is, oh my gosh, have they missed the return of Christ because they died? And they're in this quandary about what's happened. And if we die, do we miss the return of Christ? Because again, they so believed it would happen in their lifetime when people started to die in their group, they despaired. What does this mean? So again, the question is a valid one. People in the New Testament believe it was going to happen in their time. Obviously, it has not. So what is the deal? Okay. Um, so the questioner is quite correct. 
again, Jesus had some things to say about it. I think he, less than some others in the New Testament, had the idea that it would come in their lifetime. But certainly there were believers that believed that. Um, let me turn your attention uh, for the questioner and for anybody else that's interested to a scripture, 2 Peter 3, toward the end of your New Testament. 2 Peter 3, he's talking about the return of Christ. Again, however you interpret it. And in the fourth verse, 2 Peter 3, he says this. People are saying, where is the promise of his coming? So the questioner's question tonight is not a new one. He's in, he's in secure company. People in the first century were asking the same question. Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, a long time ago, when the old people died. All continues just as it was from the beginning. So in other words, we've been hearing this for a long time. So where is he? He hasn't come. Where is he? We anticipated. He hasn't shown up. Where is he? It, it goes on in that verse to kind of answer several questions that might help the questioner tonight. Um, the asker is not the first person to ask the question. Where is the promise of his coming? was a common question then. And you find out from some things that are said in that chapter that there is a clear difference in the valuation of time because it's right after that that Jesus goes on to talk about time from our perspective, time from God's perspective. And he says that with God, a thousand years is like a day, telling us that our valuation of time and God's valuation of time is different. So the valuation of time is different so what we would call a long time, God says that was nothing. <laughs> the other thing that the passage seems to indicate is there is a reason for the delay. You, you go on and read the rest of it. Um, he talks about the world being destroyed by flood. And, and so there have been end time scenarios in the past. He says in verse 8, but don't let this one fact escape your notice. And we'll kind of wrap with this. Don't let this one fact escape your notice, uh, people that I love, that the Lord one day, with, one day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. But the Lord is not slow about his promise, the promise of his coming. As some would count slowness, again, the different valuation in time, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any would perish, but all would come to repentance. Repentance is the gateway whereby we gain entrance to God and we begin our path of believing loyalty as opposed to unbelief, and that is what assures us that we will be protected. And he says that the reason for the delay, as we would count it a delay, God may not look at it as a delay. Again, the time valuation is different, but for the sake of argument, you may think it's a delay. It's not really a delay, but even if you allow it is, the delay is because of the mercy of God. So there's kind of the answer. It may or may not satisfy. The reason why Jesus hasn't returned is he's waiting, his mercy. There are other people that will hear, that will be exposed, that will become part of the elect. And my understanding of the elect are the people that have an opportunity to hear the truth. And there are more and more people that can have that opportunity that will then respond begin a life of believing loyalty and will switch allegiance to Jesus Christ from something else, themselves or some other ism, and that assures your protection. He's waiting because there are more people that have not yet heard or will not have not yet come in. So it's because of the mercy of God. Again, that may or may not satisfy, you know, the answer why. So where is he? That's where he is. Uh, he's working on things that may or may not satisfy the questioner. But it seems from the text, not from my fevered brain, and not from the prophecy teachers, but it seems from the text to be a partial answer, that the reason for the seeming delay in the return of Christ is his mercy. Are, the, are Psalms still relevant today? Great question. Uh, I've heard people say, nobody seems to sing the Psalms anymore. There used to be a lot of song, songs, worship songs, church songs, based on 
uh, the Psalms. Some of the great English hymns and gospel songs and things uh, use the verbiage from the song. Some, some were straight out of the Psalms. They set the words, the very words to music. So you do hear people say sometimes nobody ever sings the Psalms anymore. You know, when I think about the, the Psalms, I am, I am struck by that particular part of the Scripture's um, awareness of the human condition and of human psychology. The Psalms have a bead on how we're built and how we think and how we function and how we feel and how we process. And you see in the Psalms, for that reason, the entire range of human emotion expressed. Uh, you see bewilderment on the part of some people in the Psalms. You see frustration, you see outrage, you, you see irritation with successful people. Do you, you ever, Skippy, you ever get upset that some people are just really well off? Mm. Does that ever bug you? Mm, uh, certain people. I know you're a communist and I know it doesn't <laughs> bug you. You're not supposed to say that on the live stream. Oh, I should <laughs> talk politics. <laughs> But uh, no, and the Psalms deal with that. The very real thing that we feel when somebody else is, you know, seems to be better off, but they're living more wicked than I am. But still, they got more stuff and they seem better satisfied. They don't worry about the stuff I worry about. And, and the Psalms deal with that, that irritation that we can have with somebody who is more successful. Um, the Psalms deal with our frustrations with ourself. The Psalms deal a lot with our frustrations with God. They don't sugarcoat that. It's there. Uh, they deal, as I said, with bitterness. They deal with horror. They deal with terror. They be, deal with regret and grief. And they deal with elation and gratitude and peace and prayer. In fact, I say that the, the, the vocabulary of worship and the vocabulary of prayer you, you learn it in the Psalms. You learn the vocabulary of prayer and you learn the vocabulary of worship and praise from the Psalms. Uh, it makes you better at it. Uh, so that's all there because, again, the Psalms really has a unique perspective and an insight into the human condition and to our psychology. They know us. The Psalms do. Um, the Psalms tell us how to get God's attention, too, um, more than anything else, more than just securing His help how to get his attention. The Psalms are there. Uh, so, yes, the Psalms are very relevant today because they do have that insight into our souls, into our psyches. Um, I, I would just say this about the Psalms, just a, a personal with me. And this is one of my, um, this is one of my criticisms of some modern versions of the Bible, translations, paraphrases, is that they flatten out some of the language of the Psalms. The King James Version, it is old. It is 400 years old. There are parts that it helps if you are a student of Shakespeare and the poet John Donne. If you appreciate Old English poetry, you will get the King James Bible better. For that reason, I tell people, get a modern translation. It helps in your understanding until it comes to the Psalms. Most modern translations flatten the Psalms out in an attempt to make it explanatory, to tell you what it means. They flatten it. They take some of the ring out of it. They take some of the joy out of it. They take the music out of it. The translators of the King James, the authorized version, some of those people were talented poets themselves, and they knew meter, and they knew rhyme, and they were good at translating too. And for my money, it's pretty hard to beat the King James version when it comes to the Psalms and some of the other poetic parts of the Bible. Um, fully a third of the Bible is poetry. People don't realize that. It's not just confined to the Psalms. But we're talking about the Psalms, and there is value, and I see great value in reading the Psalms from the King James Version because uh, there is a rhythm in the King James Version's presentation of the Psalms that is, is very comfortable with the way we think. The Lord is my shepherd. Get that. I shall not want. I can absorb it a little better because of the way it stages it. So anyway, I'll end there, but, but most definitely the Psalms are very, very relevant today. How can I talk about Christ without starting an argument? With family and friends. You know, I, I said something about politics a minute ago. 
the old uh, saying, don't talk about politics, don't talk about religion. I uh, Put a lid on it. I'll talk about what I want to talk about. And I think there is a way to talk about both without starting the... People don't have to listen if they don't. There's no right, need to argue. Get up and go watch TV or read a book. Uh, I'm just blathering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just let Grandpa talk. Um, no, there are, there are ways to talk about both. So the question is, how do I talk about Christianity, Christ, Jesus, all of that with my friends and family without starting an argument? Uh, just a word... Um, um, is, is really all you need to speak. We, we think when we start to talk about, you know, our faith, uh, our allegiance to Jesus Christ, which to me that is faith. I have an allegiance to Jesus because he's an allegiance to me. I talked about that this last Sunday. We made a Sunday. little video. Right? You made a little clip video, yeah, uh, out of that. So it's circulating out in the ether right now. Mm -hmm. But I believe that, that the word faith, it, faith doesn't mean a wishful thinking or hope or, you know, some nebulous idea, but it means allegiance. I have signed on. He, I have, I've sworn allegiance to him. He is my leader. I am cooperating with him. I have switched from other leaders that I was following, other isms, other ideas, other gods, if you want to think of them that way. And it's Jesus Christ for me. And I've sworn an allegiance to him because he's sworn an allegiance to me. That, to me, is faith. And people... You know, say, well, you know, if I talk about my faith, I got to explain everything and, you know, where Adam got his belly button and I've got to answer every question and dot every I and cross every T and be the Bible answer man and all that. Not necessarily. Just a word inserted in a conversation, just a short phrase, if it's from the heart and it's motivated by the Spirit in the context of your family and friends, will not start an argument and can be much more valuable than a long discourse on why you believe the Bible or, or, or anything related to faith. Uh, and that's in keeping with the word that, that talks about the value of, of, of a word rightly spoken has the value of an apple of gold in a setting of silver. A golden apple on a platter of silver is very valuable if they're pure. The Word of God, one little phrase fitly spoken, one word rightly spoken can be an apple of gold in a setting of silver. So again, you don't have to blather on. Um, but, but consider this. It may be better, it may be better to talk to God about your friends than to talk to your friends about God. In other words, Pray. Bring your friends, your family that you feel like could benefit from what you have encountered in Jesus Christ, what he has shown you, how he has molded you. You know that they could benefit from that. Before you talk to them, spend a lot of time talking to God about them rather than talking to your friends about God. And I, I think scripture will support me in this. Um, you may want to look at Acts chapter 26, verse 18. There is to me a, a, a snippet of a verse there that is tailor-made to how you do this, how you talk to God about your friends, rather than jumping into the arena and talking to your friends about God first. And, and, and the verse is, is in uh, Acts 26. And it says this in the, in the 18th verse. Paul was talking about, he happens to be talking about uh, his tribe. He's talking about the Jewish people and how he prays for them. He's, but, it, but it works across the board. Here's how you can pray for your friends and, and family and bring them before God. He says, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light, from the domain of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Break it down real quick. Here's how you can pray for your, your friends. Before you talk to them about God, talk to God about your friends. Here's how you do it. You start by like this verse says, God, open their eyes. The reason people do not see the beauty of Jesus Christ is because their eyes are closed. They're closed. To, because of other things, they're closed because of the enemy, they're closed because they never opened them. But the fact is their eyes are closed. So you start by saying, God, open our eyes. And then 
if you pray, open their eyes, and God begins to open their eyes to Jesus Christ and how beautiful he is. The Bible says he's altogether lovely. And this is a supernatural thing that's got to take place. It's not you persuading them like a lawyer. But if they open their eyes and they're in darkness, they still don't see anything. Well, the verse has got you. It says, pray first that God would open their eyes and then pray that they might turn from darkness to light. See, the problem with most people is that, that are without a, a living, breathing relationship with God through Jesus Christ is not only are their eyes closed, but they can't distinguish the difference. They can't see the value. We talked about valuation of time. They can't see the valuation between light and darkness. It's, it's all a muddle to them. And so you begin to pray, hey, God, let them see the difference between light and dark and how much better light is than dark, okay? Okay, so then after that, and, and then that they might turn from the dominion of Satan to God. Okay, now they've got a degree of light. Now help them to see that they've been lied to a lot by the adversary. The word hasatan means adversary, and he's very tricky at lying. And they've been lied to a lot, and they believe things about God that were myths. Help them begin to distinguish light from darkness to the point that they can see there is a very definite difference between the enemy's agenda for their life and God's agenda. Jesus says in John 10.10 10, that he's come, Jesus has come, that we might have life and have it more abundant. He's talking about the continuum of life, not just life in the hereafter, but life now. He wants us to have a full life now, a fuller life then. He wants us to enjoy life now, enjoy life then. That's what he's come for, that we would be fully functional humans. But he also says that the agenda of the, of the enemy, Satan, is to kill and steal and destroy. So God, open their eyes. Let them be able to distinguish light from darkness. Then step number three, let them be able to tell the difference between God's agenda and the enemy's agenda. And they are vastly different. Okay? And then this verse 18, chapter 26 of Acts, that they may receive forgiveness of sins. That, that the sin burden, the thing that sends everybody to the psychiatrist's couch, the thing that fractures families, the thing that causes nations to be at each other's throat, that causes murder and molestation and abuse of women and racism and all the rest, sin, that it will be forgiven. It will be dealt with. It will be, it will be snuffed out. It will be, as Paul will talk about in one of his Corinthian letters, that God would kill the sin that is in me. Because if the sin that's in me is not killed, it will kill me. So he will take care of that, that they, they would know that. Okay, so that their eyes would be open, that they distinguish light from darkness, that they can tell the difference between God's plan and the enemy's plan, vastly different. And then the next step is, like I've said here, that as they turn from that domain of Satan to the domain of God, they switch allegiances, switch kingdoms, that as they do that, that they would begin to come to a realization of what it is to be free from sin, from the dominion of sin, uh, the, the prison of sin. And then the final thing is that they would have an understanding of their inheritance. We're talking adoption. We're talking family talk there. The amazing thing is not that we've been forgiven. We have been in the Christian circles for the last 700 years. We've been in a discussion about who's saved, who's not saved, how long you're saved, can you get unsaved? Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. When we probably, and for, about forgiveness, when we probably should have been having a 700 year discussion about adoption, which is a much more amazing thing. Are you freaking kidding me? This ends up with me and God's family. Is that what you're telling me? That I become his son? That he loves me with the same love that he has for Jesus? Are, is that what you're telling me? That's what I'm telling you. That's really what the whole book is talking about. That's what the program is about. We talk only about forgiveness. Hey, come to the altar, get your sins forgiven, sign your name here. You're saved, brother, because your sins are forgiven. Forgiven sins is wonderful, but that's only one side of the cross. The other side of the cross is adoption. You are brought into the family of God. You are brought into the circle. You are brought into the relationship. You are included in who God is because God is a relationship. That's what it means to be in Christ or to have Christ in you. That's what we're talking about. That's a mind-blowing concept that we're adopted. So God, here's this progression here. You pray 
for your friend. Again, I think it's better to talk to God about your friends than talk to your friends about God. At least do it first. And the way you do it is God open their eyes. Now let them see light from darkness. Now let them transfer from Satan's domain to God's domain, switch kingdoms. And, and then let them know forgiveness. The sin thing lifted that's just crushing, you know, and guilt and all that. And, and then let them know they're adopted, that they're a daughter, they're a son, not a servant. It's a weird thing, man. The, the way I read the scheme is that when we are living outside of God, we are in effect enemies of God, but he takes his enemies, me principally, I'm his big enemy. Um, he takes me, the enemy of God, and he doesn't turn me into a servant. I could get that. You know, a king comes into uh, against an army, and this army's trying to slit his throat, but he beats that army, and he turns all those guys, his enemies, former enemies, into slaves. I get that. That's not what he does. He takes his enemies, and rather than turning them into servants, he makes us sons and daughters. Weird concept. Mind-blowing concept. You can feed on that for a long time. But that's how you pray for your friends. That's how you talk to your friend, talk to, your, to God about your friends before you go off half-cocked and start talking to your friends about God. Okay, why do all preachers sound the same? Oh, that's a great one. I, you know, I, we got this last week, I think, and I've loved, I have absolutely loved, and uh, thanks to whoever asked that goofy question because it has made me chuckle in the night hour as I've thought about it. <laughs> uh, because dadgummit, sure enough, a bunch of them do sound the same. Uh, as I thought about it, I even went and, and looked at rec recordings and YouTubes and stuff. You know what? Whoever asked that question, they're onto something there. Uh, we used to have a phrase um, that you, after a Sunday service, you would go home and have preacher for lunch. Or if you went to a restaurant with other people in the church, you had preacher for lunch. What that meant was that you sat there and you probably didn't talk about the content of the sermon, but you critiqued his or her performance. You know, too long, too short, too loud, too soft, too whatever, you know, or why that to topic, too complicated. Uh, again, like I said, too long. Um, and, and people complain, you know, oh, the sermon was too long. So then the guy adjusts it and, and then they say, well, that was hardly worth going. He, he didn't, didn't do very much at all. Or too political or not political enough or never talks about the real world or it goes on and on and on. The, the criticisms, the way people would have, as I said, preacher for lunch. Um, they would criticize his gestures. He's too demonstrative. He's not demonstrative enough. He paces too much. He stands too still. Um, he circles and just all kinds of stuff. There would be criticism. Um, but when you think about it, that's not exclusive to preachers. You know that they, they kind of all sound the same. Um, <laughs> because when I listen to color commentators, like for football, close your eyes, they kind of all sound the same. When you listen to a lot of politicians fielding questions and they don't really answer the questions put before them, they answer another question they want to answer, and how they twist that, they all sound the same. Uh, you could say the same thing about lawyers. You could say the same thing about stand-up comics. Cops. I was thinking about cops. Cops. They all have that deadpan, you know. Just the facts, man. Just the facts. <laughs> uh, but stand-up comics, hey, how's everybody tonight? Good to see you. Hey, Portland, how you doing tonight? Great to see you. You've been a great crowd. Good night, everybody. I mean, stand-up comics kind of all mimic each other. Um, singers, vocalists, same thing. Uh, a lot of the people on American Idol all sound the same. I'm not a big TV watcher, but I watched a couple episodes when it was the big show of The West Wing. It was a good show. I liked it. Martin Sheen's one of my That's favorite old, actors. Old show. Yeah, yeah, but he's one of my favorite actors is why I watched it. But I got the impression it was unwatchable to me because I, it was good show, good plot, good dialogue, all that. But it was almost unwatchable to me because I got the impression that all of those people are trying to act like each other. They're all kind of in the know. They're all kind of cynical. They're all kind of worldly wise. 
Um, but movies go through times where everybody sounds the same. Film noir, you know, the early 50s, late 40s, all the detective movies and stuff, they're all snappy patter. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir. Okay. So the imitative thing, uh, it's there among preachers for sure. Um, but it's, it's among other people as well. I, Is there like a class at preacher school that you take? <laughs> no, no, you do take homiletics if you go to a decent homiletics. seminary. Homiletics. Homiletics, it's called. It's how you structure and deliver sermons. But, um, and some of the popular preachers miss that class, by the way. But, um, no, I, I think there, there's something to be said for the way some preachers are, are imitating other preachers. I'm thinking of, of in the mid to late 1800s, uh, there was a popular preacher by the name of Henry Ward Beecher. His sister wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. But he was a very popular congregational preacher, had a big church in New York City, long before the mega church era, but he had one. Because he was such an effective communicator, the guy was actually a pulpiteer. He, he performed in the pulpit. And he, he was, he, um, stage actors would come and study him because he, he, was, he was performing, but he was very good and people performed like him. Uh, they called him the most, and he was, the most famous man in America during part of his lifetime. More people knew about Henry Ward Beecher than, than knew who the president was. He was extremely popular. Uh, and for that reason, a lot of preachers imitated Henry Ward Beecher with his flowery language and j big gestures and all of that. Uh, there was a lot of imitation. A uh, preacher by the name of Billy Sunday came along in the early 1800s or 1900s, former baseball, professional baseball player. And he was very animated, but kind of crude in his talk and very earthy. And he would do antics on the platform. He, he would come to a city and set up a big tent or build a board tabernacle uh, for several weeks and just pack the thing out with thousands of people because he was so dramatic. And he would act out his sermons and he would, um, because he had former baseball, he would, he would look for times in the message where he could run across the stage and like he was sliding in home and then like a good baseball player stand up on the base because he knew how to do it, so he did it. People ate it up. All kind of preachers tried to imitate that. Preachers broke their legs learned, trying to learn how to slide like Billy Sunday. Uh, Amy Semple McPherson, founder of the Foursquare Gospel Church, um, super dramatic and there were many people that tried to imitate her, men and women. Along comes Billy Sunday, uh, Billy uh, Graham. And when Billy first started, he was very fiery. He was very much a fire and brimstone-y type guy, but he toned it down as his popularity grow, grew and he became more of a folksy, conversational type preacher. And he went through an era where he would mention himself by first name in his ser a lot of his sermons. You know, a man came up to me and he said, Billy, uh, what do you think about the end of the world? He said, I don't know. <laughs> and so you had all kind of preachers that were talking about themselves in the first person and by their first name in their sermons and, and ending things with, I don't know. They were just copying Billy Graham. So when you say preachers all sound alike, we don't all sound alike, but there is a lot of imitation going on. We're in a time um, that's a little bit different. Um, preaching is more confessional, like the many popular preachers uh, and then people that copy them, they're kind of, let me tell you my story or my failings or my, you know, my struggles type thing. And the, the style of preaching today among many is more conversational. In fact, it's called narrative preaching. It's a style of preaching and many do it uh, and, and many mimic somebody else in their dress and their mannerisms and how they pace. and. And all of that kind of thing. When uh, Chuck Smith started the Calvary Chapel, he was a verse-by-verse -verse preacher. And all across the country, a lot of people became verse-by-verse -verse preachers. You know, We'd pick up next week where we had left off last week, just like Chuck. Um, we're living in a time where that's kind of the thing, that conversational style, and there is a lot of copying. Um, there have been eras when there were, not too long ago, when there were great speakers, great teachers that had a presence, people like Adrian Rogers and uh, Lloyd Ogilvy and, and C.M. Ward in our movement was a great expositor, a great preacher. Uh, a guy by the name of Donald Gray Barnhouse, a Presbyterian pastor, was a great preacher that way, great command of the pulpit. 
uh, his, the one who followed him in the pulpit at, in Philadelphia, a fellow by the name of uh, Montgomery Boyce. Again, great voice, great preacher. Martin Lloyd-Jones, there, there are a lot of them. Those are kind of out of vogue right now. The guy that can command the audience with his voice type thing. But I, I think it will come back. I expect it will come back. But is there imitation? Yep. Yep. All right, so we're going to close on this one. This will be our last question. You have five minutes to answer this, okay? Can you explain Revelation in a nutshell? Actually, I can. In five minutes? I can. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you the reason I can is because... No way. I, yeah, I don't really understand it. So <laughs> That's just, the answer. Just, just a quiet <laughs> aside. No, I, I'm not a Revelation expert. Although, uh, we're doing a series now at our church. I think we're on number six of seven this week. Um, talking about the less weird parts of the book of Revelation and going to wrap that up. And I was thinking a few weeks ago, well, what are you going to follow up the less weird parts of the book of Revelation with? And I, and I had an epiphany. I had an epiphany. And I'm going to follow it up and do seven, seven weeks on the very weird parts of the book of Revelation. <laughs> but I won't even with that pretend to explain what that book's about. It's a mystery book. And if you want to find out more about that, what come and join us for that series, The Very Weird Parts, because I'll deal with that a little bit. But I, I don't pretend to be an expert or, or an interpreter. On the Bible it. app, there's a really good lesson about Revelation where the guy walks you through it step by step. Oh, there's there's some people that do have a, a good handle on it. Michael Heiser does a great job. Yeah. There are others, um, and, and I would direct you in their, in their direction. But here's what I do know about Revelation. I, I see, and again, you don't have to think like I think or track where I am or map over what I'm mapping. But to me, when I read Revelation, and I got this as a revelation, when I uh, sat down and read it all in one sitting one time, it took me a couple hours, and that told me that maybe, just maybe, it's, it's not a linear account. You know, this happens, then this happens, and this happens, as some people would have it, and that's the way they try and interpret it. But I got it got a feeling it might be telling the same story three or four times in different ways with different images. Just a thought. But regardless of how you interpret it, I do believe that there are some really broad themes. And one of them is that God is in control. You ask me in a nutshell, what's it about? It's about God is in control. May look kooky, may look haywire, the world may look like it's going to hell in a handbasket real quick. But it ain't because actually God is in control. Can't see it behind the scenes. He's doing stuff. God is in control. And he will work his will. That's why the whole story ends with the new heaven and new earth. That is God's home as he always envisioned it back in the garden. That's why the temple is built with garden motif. Because you want to meet God, you meet him in a garden. Why? Because he wants to have a family in a garden setting. And that's what he had in Eden and we screwed it up. The original design was that human beings would turn the whole world into a garden, but we obviously have not done that. Um, you know, ride through some of our cities, we have not turned it into a garden. <laughs> but, um, but he gets his way in the end because he's in control. New heavens, new earth, he's in control. It will be a garden again. Um, so that's one of the big mega themes, God is in control. The other is that Jesus will return. Now I don't know. Some people say he will return before a thing called the tribulation. Some say in the middle, some say after. Some say it's a totally different scheme than all that. Again, I'm not subtle enough to know. I got an opinion, but that's all I got. Um, but I do know that the book is very clear, Revelation, he will return, Jesus will return, and he will be a conqueror, and he will win. And everything he wants is gonna happen with the people he wants it to happen with. The other thing that I, I believe is a big mega theme there is that salvation is available to anybody who wants it. You see that in the revelation, however you interpret it. If you want to be protected by Jesus, you want to be under God's protection, you will be under God's protection. Uh, no matter what point in history or no matter how bad it gets, God can protect people if you want to be protected. That word salvation means protection. If you want it, you can have it. If you don't want it, nobody forces it on you. So salvation is available to everybody that wants it. And the final thing um, is, is, is one that is, is kind of easy to miss. 
unless you look at the revelation, you know, in its totality, in its in its everything. And that is, and I base this on the seven letters at the very beginning, all have a commonality. They're all very different messianic communities. They have different issues. He commends them for different things. He criticizes them for different things, but they all have a promise of overcoming. If you overcome, if you continue in believing loyalty to Jesus Christ, your allegiance to him, that's what faith is. That's what it's all about. It's not about, you know, having a, a crisis experience where you say, I'm saved. It's about believing loyalty. If you keep that in, in motion, in, in, and keep it current, and you don't slip into unbelief, and you don't switch teams, and you don't, you know, say, uh, I'm not following Jesus anymore, I'm following this, even if this is me. But if you keep your believing loyalty on Jesus, you're an overcomer. And what the book tells me is you're either an overcomer or you will be overcome. And there doesn't seem to be any gray in between. You're an overcomer or you're overcome. So those big themes is, is what I see there, that God is in control, Jesus will return, salvation is available to anybody who wants it, and um, you're either an overcomer or you're overcome. So knock yourself out. Read the book of Revelation. That's what it's about. <laughs> All right, that's all we have time for. Well, then that's all we'll do. Okay. You know, I hope you've enjoyed that beverage. I have. Uh, before we wrap up. <laughs> Why would you bring that up? What's wrong with the beverage? <laughs> what you do I needed it? a clumsy segue to take a drink. Oh, okay. <laughs> Listen, we're glad that you joined us uh, for the last few minutes. Hope it's been valuable to you. It's just my opinion, uh, and I'm the world's foremost authority on my own opinion. That's all it is. If you don't like an answer I gave, keep digging, most especially keep looking in this book because I assure you the answer is there. So we thank you that you have joined us. We are with Alta Vista Assembly in Bakersfield, California, a good, healthy church. We're bouncing back from all the ravages of COVID and lockdown, and, and I'm happy to see there are good indicators of health. We've got a great picnic planned and just all kinds of things that are opening up now as, as we get back into full gear. So we meet on Sunday, 10 o'clock, and if you're in the Bakersfield area and you don't have a home church, we would welcome you. If you do have a home church and you're in any area, I encourage you to be there. Don't rely on live streams when you could be there. It ain't the same. So if you don't have a home church and you're around on Sunday, this Lord's Day, uh, come and join us, 529 Crawford Street. We are beginning to land the plane with the less weird parts of the book oh, of Revelation. Yeah and we'll begin to take off soon on the very weird parts. So 10 o'clock, we always live stream that 10 o'clock. We have a two o'clock Spanish, a 7.30 Spanish as well. So you can join us for any or all of those. We live stream that 10 o'clock. So whether we see each other next time live or live stream, let's do our very best to stay connected.